It's August 10th, 7 o'clock, and it's the August meeting of the Hadley Climate Change Committee. And we have some special guests. I know one of our guests is here now, and hopefully the other guests will be rolling in in a little while, and that's Mike Spanknable and Catalina. Welcome. Um, Chris, if you would share a little bit about your background. Sure. You guys work with Pioneer Valley Planning Commission at all? We did, and that's one reason we are now officially a green community. Oh, excellent. And the town gets $139,000 toward um, energy reduction and greenhouse and gas reducing projects. Yeah, absolutely great. Well, so I'm Chris Curtis. Um, I have a uh, small consulting business called uh, Conservation Works that's based in Waitley, um, and we help communities with a variety of projects. Um, I'm also the MVP, or Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Coordinator for the town of Deerfield. Um, and we have a committee much like yours, which is, we call it the MVP Climate Resiliency Core Group, because it's a, made up of a core of some of the town staff and board members from boards like Planning Board and Conservation Commission and so forth that um, work on these issues. Going back a little bit in time, the reason I asked about PVPC is that I spent most of my career working for Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, um, where I was chief planner for, I, was, I worked there for about 40 years, um, and I've retired from that now, um, and so I'm kind of doing this in my so-called spare time. Yeah. Um, so in Deerfield, um, I'm a Deerfield resident. We kind of got started on this um, in 2016, I think. We were um, awarded a grant for doing a municipal vulnerability preparedness plan and finished that in 2017. And we were actually the first community in Massachusetts to get our MVP plan certified by the state, um, which was really helpful in a lot of ways, actually, because it sort of set us up to apply for action grants and um, being early on in the game we were able to you know really take advantage of that and get a number of action grants kind of before a lot of communities even really got started on the program so we've gotten um, action grants in 2018 2019 2020 2021 and we just got in 2020 this is 2023 now we're in the, that fiscal year just got an action grant awarded about a week ago, and we also got an MVP 2.0 grant at the same time. So I think we've gotten one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven MVP grants in Deerfield now. So yeah. are all the action grants through the MVP program? Mm -hmm. or? Yeah. Okay. And how much? How much of the grants are on? Well. Uh, the first action grant was 66,000, and we got one for 389,000. In 2020, we got 769,000. Wow, wow. That's good lots of one. In 2021, <laughs> we got 66,000, and the one that we just got was, I think, 280,000. Wow. So, Impressive. where's the capacity coming from? Do you have a full-time grant writer, or how it's how me. is this happening? It's me. <laughs> well done. Um, yeah. You know, I, I did this for my entire career, so I, yeah. I'm good at it. <laughs> I'm you know, able to write grants and be pretty successful with them. Um, and I'm kind of doing this partly as a consultant to the town and partly sort of as a volunteer. It's a little bit of a hybrid situation. Yeah. So I'm just trying to kind of help out my hometown here at this point. And what were, what were some of the projects. reasons, what are some of the projects you have? Yeah, I was going to go over that. That's what I was going to okay. kind of talk about a bit. Um, so one, one of the things I often say to groups is that, you know, addressing climate change has really two components, climate mitigation and climate resiliency. So mitig mitigation, in my definition, are projects that um, address reducing our carbon footprint meaning the communities or individuals' carbon footprints and reducing impacts on global warming. So steps like um, transitioning to electric vehicles, making public buildings more energy efficient, um, 
Installing things like heat pumps and solar panels in, in public buildings, um, all of those kinds of things are in the mitigation category. And resiliency are actions that towns can take to um, prepare for the effects and impacts of climate change. So we're expected to have much more extreme weather going forward. We're already seeing that, or, you know, as, as evidenced by the last week in, in Deerfield, where you probably heard all of this news, but uh, we had, I think, five pretty significant roads that got taken out. Um, and some of them really badly. Uh, Route 116 going up to Conway has been repaired now, but if you've looked at it, it's pretty impressive, the damage that was done there. So what our MVP plan says is, you know, based on climate projections, and it would be the same for Hadley as it is for Deerfield, um, you know, we're expecting um, a lot more rainfall, heavy, you know, intense rainfall events, particularly in the winter months but more rainfall generally, uh, more of those kind of events that we had last week, um, or I guess it was has it been two weeks now, mm -hmm. anyway, um, more of those type of events. Um, drought in the summertime, um, but flooding is kind of the big issue for us. And because in Deerfield we have the confluence of two rivers, we have, you know, the Deerfield and the Connecticut River, we've got flooding coming at us from two different places. And, that's shown to be an issue in the various storms like Hurricane Irene, um, where we had really major impacts um, from that storm as well. Do you have levees anywhere around Deerfield? Not that I can think of. No, no. Um, we have floodplains, um, <laughs> and I, you know, consider that a good thing. The, the problem with levees is that they, they, you know, <laughs> they take out your floodplain. And the floodplain can't function the way it's supposed to naturally, you know, work. But our floodplains are, like in Hadley, mostly active farmland. So when you have floods, you have damages to crops, and you know our farmers have really, you know, been hit hard by that. So that's a that's a bit of a dilemma. Um, so. Um, We've been working on these grants, and I guess some of the principal things that, that we've done with the money so far, I guess they fall into two broad categories, um, structural changes that we're making and uh, public outreach education, maybe three categories. I think the re there's a regulatory category, I would say, as well. So the big kind of structural things that we've done is we've replaced two of our most problematic culverts in town, one right in the center of town next to the high school and one out closer to the Deerfield River, with culverts that are designed for climate change. Designed. So you're talking about by Frontier High School? Yeah. Okay. So are they larger, they, more water can move through there? Right. So the, the, the culverts were originally collapsing, you know, traditional metal culverts that were not functioning well. What we replaced them with was um, it's kind of like an almost a miniature arched bridge type of a structure. Open bottom culverts. Open bottom. Mm -hmm. They're designed um, to pass much more flood water. They're designed to be much more um, resilient in terms of structure. And they also, because they're open, open bottom culverts, are designed to promote the passage of fish and wildlife, which a lot of culverts don't do a very good job of, and fish and wildlife with climate change are going to need to be able to migrate, and um, culverts are one place that that happens. So, so we've done two of these now. You know they're expensive, but I will say that you know looking at them after the last set of you know big rainfall events, they fared really well, whereas a lot of the traditional culverts in town got taken out. I just have a question. So specifically about this latest flooding event and the roads that washed out in Deerfield. Have you identified, like, what exactly happened there? Was it related to culverts or just so much water coming through there? Um, I mean, what, what would you do in the future? My own just observations, because yeah. our committee actually meets next week. We haven't had a chance to have this discussion yet, and 
be interested to hear what you know our DPW and police yeah. folks say about that. But from my observation, yes, it was the, the worst of the damages were culverts that were undersized or underperforming, and they got taken out completely. Uh, Lower Road in Deerfield, mm -hmm. if you know that road, was a good example of that. Um, you know, there's just a big canyon where the culvert used to be. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, someone drove into that, but um, that was um, fortunate that there was someone there to to rescue that person, and there was no loss of life. But that was a pretty, pretty serious incident. There's also some places where there were steep roads where the, the drainage just, you know, basically went, went the down the side of the road and sort of went, Undermined. took out the underneath part of the road, the gravel underneath the road. So you had these big kind of cave, you know, caves underneath the roads that happened on 116 and on Stillwater Road um, and other places as well. So a couple of different kinds of scenarios. Um, so, you know, again, we need to do more of that type of work. The problem that towns, you know, are faced with when they have this emergency sort of situation is I think a lot of towns will tend to go put back the same culvert that and got washed out. Do, that's why I was asking you is that thinking ahead, you definitely would not want to do what was there. Like, what are you going to do for, right. so you're ready for the next event? Right. And I feel like it's something, fortunately, we didn't lose five roads, but yeah. we need to be paying attention to that same kind of stuff in Hadley. Certainly on the edges of lots of fields. So in North Hadley, off Meadow Street, that was all flooded. Aqua Vita flooded with a lot of farmland flooded. You know, the, the core of the town is protected, but there's a lot of Hadley that's not. And the water will actually come around the river and kind of back in to some of those fields. And it was a really significant loss for a lot of farmers. But that's our floodplain. Yeah. It so it's, it's going to flood there. Kind of nothing we can do about that. I just wonder about culverts. That's the main thing on my mind. Our culverts and road edges. Yeah. The undermining yeah, yeah, yeah. so that yeah. we can get through yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, some of the other structural things that we've been doing, um, this kind of crosses over into public awareness as well, is um, we've been doing um, rain gardens um, mm -hmm. to capture and recharge stormwater on site. Mm -hmm. So we've done two rain gardens at the elementary school, and we have just gotten funded for one in the town center in this new grant that we got. And then we've been doing something called tree box filters, which are you know basically a tree in a large concrete box that's located underground that has a uh, capacity to infiltrate stormwater, and, and you put these in we put them in, in the center of town, in the center of South Deerfield, and we've got uh, six of them at this point that are in the center of town. And again, those function to try to um, reduce the amount of stormwater that's going into the, the stream, the bloody brook in the case of South Deerfield, and reduce flooding that way. Um, so we've got another one of those funded in the new grant as well. We're going to do that one in historic Deerfield. So these are in the category of what's called green infrastructure, and that's one of the things that the MVP program is specifically Resilience. looking to fund. Um, so those are high, high profile. What is a tree box? Products. What is it? Well, again, it's basically a large concrete square box that's located in the street underground, filled with soil that um, can um, infiltrate stormwater. And there's a tree planted in it. And it's, a, it's a dry tree. well. Kind of like that, yeah. A little more functional than that. Um, and, you know, the idea is to try to recharge stormwater on site um, to the extent possible. And it's connected to the storm drain system, so if there's an overflow, it can, has a place to go. But we try to keep as much of it on site as possible. So is, is it kind of like a little catch basin or something? Yeah, what are you using for material? Is it peat moss or something? No, it's it's a soil um, mixture, not, not anything particularly fancy. Okay. Um, but 
can drain. Yeah, exactly. Interesting. So we've been we've been doing some green infrastructure projects, um, and then we've done a number of public awareness activities. The big ones have been we've had two now uh, regional climate forums. These have been day-long events um, held at Frontier. Was that at Frontier? Yeah. yeah. A few yeah, of us had a chance to go. Yeah. Oh, good. It was, so yeah. you, it was you know really worth that. it. I guess for the rest of you that didn't go, they, quickly, that what we did was um, we brought in guest speakers on a variety of climate-related topics, and we had a series of workshops running um, simultaneously. So there were speakers on everything from you know, how to, you know, do solar in your community to electric vehicles to, you know, infrastructure kinds of projects and farming techniques and all kinds of things. Um, so we did that twice. We did it in, we did it before COVID and after COVID. <laughs> um, and uh, we had like, the last one we had like 32 speakers. So it was a big production to try to organize and pull it off. But we had you know, like 100 people, 125 people show up, and it's a pretty good turnout, and um, we recorded all the sessions, and those are on the town's website, so people can watch them if they couldn't go. And I think it was a real, you know, positive thing for the town. We had people from, like Hadley, we had folks from neighboring towns that came as well, so a lot of participation regionally. So we did that. Um, we've been doing, um, several different kinds of education programs. We have a climate curriculum that we drafted and put together that is going to, it's being used in the, in the middle school and high school. And can can uh, you just briefly share a little bit more? Like what's in the climate curriculum? Yeah, um, I'm trying to remember what's in it, but um, you know, what we did was to use the guest speaker kind of format, the similar to what we did okay. at the forum, but sort of um, oriented towards middle school, high school age students, and it's in their within their science curriculum. So we would we would bring in um, speakers on topics like um, climate impacts on forestry. Um, and climate impacts on soil health and farming. And these speakers would come in and talk about that and we'd record the session so they could be reused. And the students would connect to those things and, and their ongoing science curriculum that they were working on, whatever class that was. So one of the big things we did was um, we had a soil health day. We did this kind of collaboratively with this group called Regenerative Design Group in Greenfield um, Keith Salzberg's really great guy, and and we had uh, I think we had 70 students go out, and they were taking soil samples out in the farm fields and in the high school property, and learning about the soil profile and how soil healthy soils are an important um, attenuator of carbon, actually, and and having healthy soils is really critical as part of our overall game plan for how we're going to deal with carbon. So they learned about that um, with a hands-on kind of a experience. And um, yeah, so briefly, that's kind of what, what we did. Um, and then um, one of the big things we did was to adopt what was what's called a green infrastructure policy in town. It's something that I kind of worked on for a long time, even before I was working in Deerfield. I, have been sort of kind of conjuring this up in my head, but the green infrastructure policy basically says that the town will take certain steps to promote its climate resiliency as a part of its overall policy of how the town gets run. So, for example, when Deerfield replaces its vehicles, they will make every attempt to you, to replace them with electric vehicles going forward, or at least hybrid vehicles. Um, so that goes for even the DPW trucks and things like that. Um, you know, when the town is, is able to um, seek grants, they're going to try to, you know, move towards greener buildings. 
solar and geothermal are things that the town's looking at um, for all the town um, building complexes. And then um, it's sort of keyed into some of the zoning initiatives that we've also been heavily working on. And I'm kind of a, I'm a person that's worked on zoning for a long time and I've been thinking about different innovative ways to do zoning to achieve some of the goals that we have. So uh, one of the things that we did was adopted what's called green development performance standards. Um, and that says that, you know, it's hard to explain this briefly, but basically any large project, commercial, industrial, or multifamily residential that comes into town has to be designed to meet these green development performance standards. So we're trying to encourage, um, you know, keeping stormwater on site, minimizing disruption of the landscape, trying to keep trees intact to the extent possible, um, things of that nature. It's, it's pretty complicated. It'd take me probably <laughs> 45 minutes just to explain the performance standards, but it's something that... Chris, is this on your website? Is it on the yes. website? Yes, yeah, like so you can, if you're interested. Yeah. You can probably all the things that we dream of do, that we would love to do. <laughs> Yeah. Are you making solar a requirement or? Well, it's not a requirement, but there are incentives in the bylaw that basically say if you do a green roof or if you do solar, then you get certain benefits like um, reduced parking requirements. Actually, there's some ideas in it that are similar to if you know Hadley's transfer of development rights bylaw. Mm -hmm. There are some ideas that are kind of similar to that. I actually wrote that by law too when I was at PVPC. Um, so there's, you know, it's it's both, you know, requirements and incentives. There's yeah. a combination of both in it. So we're also we did that. We did um, a new floodplain and river protection zoning bylaw that really makes it extremely difficult to build in the floodplain. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of towns think they have floodplain zoning, but really what they have is zoning that um, might have some conditions on building in the floodplain, but doesn't prevent it from happening. Jane, do you know, does Hadley have floodplain zoning? Yes. Hadley has floodplain zoning. Okay. And um, we've put in the, the recent requirement, which this year for the first time with the potential flood, of having all of the trailers registered so they know who to notify to get them moved. So in the honey pot, in the honey those pot. trailers, okay. Well, and also further down river. Oh, that's true. But do we have building restrictions in the floodplain? Yeah. Yes. We're part of the National Flood Insurance Program. And that yeah, any, any town basically that is in the flood insurance program has to have some level of floodplain zone. Okay. I guess the point I'm making is that a lot of the bylaws are not particularly restrictive and the and the minimum you know zoning that the flood insurance program requires is not much so we tried to do much better than that in Deerfield and write something that was kind of cutting edge and more innovative are you participating in the community rating system, community rating system it's basically when you go above and beyond the minimum requirements you get um, brownie points, if you will, and thereby reductions in the price of the insurance. Oh, I'm not sure I know about that, actually. Well, then. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. I mean, I'm not a town staff person, so right. I don't do that work, but um, but that's interesting to know about. Uh, we also did a solar zoning bylaw that um, is set up to try to make it easier to do solar in town, um, but also to have a pretty decent set of standards for large-scale commercial um, solar projects that do have impacts. Um, and then we set up this um, MVP core group that was part of our, that's part of our green infrastructure policy that establishes the MVP core group and makes it a, you know, a permanent ongoing group advisory to the select board. And we have two select board members that sit on it. Um, so. It, you know, we, we can really get things to happen that way. Does Hadley, Hadley is involved with MVP, do we have any kind of core group? Is that something that Mike would be part of necessarily? Not yet. Okay. But this group would mm -hmm. be a perfect 
you know, example of that. I'm not sure what your membership is here, um, but you could easily, you know, replicate what Deerfield is doing by perhaps adding some town officials or somebody some from the planning board, and planning select conservation board, DPW, commission, conservation. Okay. okay. All right. Um, in our case, the assistant town administrator is on it. Um, so, yeah. What's the population of Deerfield? I should know the answer to that, but I don't keep numbers in my head very well. well. I think it's like 8,000. Okay. Thank sound you. Sound right? Okay. Yeah. So, given that I got to go shortly, yeah. I'll just stop there and see if I can answer any questions quickly. I have a question. Is, is a electric highway department truck practical? Um, I, I don't know if I can fully answer that question because I haven't really looked into it, but the idea is to, to try to move in that direction. I think there are a number of vehicles that you could do that with. You know, we have a lot of pickup trucks, for example, that could easily be replaced with, with electric pickup trucks um, or, or hybrid. Um, whether there's electric dump trucks, I honestly don't know at this point where it's that stands. It's not efficient yet for the heavier vehicles. It's what? It's not efficient yet for the heavier vehicles, mm -hmm. but it's coming. They're working on it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is changing pretty rapidly. I think there'll be, there'll be electric vehicles of, of all kinds in the next right. couple of years. I mean, at the moment in Hadley, the requirement is under 8,500 pounds you need to look to go to green. Did you have a population for Deerfield? Yes, 5,125 people. <laughs> well, we are bigger than you? That's oh, amazing. Oh, yeah, that's, I think, definitely true. Only by 100 or so. Uh -huh. Oh, is that it? Yeah. And you have I think we're like 52, but 66. If they can do it, we can do it. Okay. That's right. There we go. Yeah, All right. yeah. Moving right along. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm curious, what are some of your takeaways about the solar on the, the transfer station in Deerfield? I saw that in the Gazette last day or two. I didn't see that, so I'm not okay. up Solar on the transfer station? In, that's not, in that's not one of my projects. Oh, I okay. That. I didn't know if that was something you were involved with. No. Okay. Uh, MVP is really focused on resilience building, not on, on the energy okay. side. As far yeah. as the mitigation is concerned. Gotcha. Well, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Yes. Yeah. 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 Very impressive. Impressive. Thank you. Thanks for finding time yeah. Yeah, sure. to do this. Right. And, and we will write run for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. As a consultant. For a fee. Yeah. yeah. yeah maybe. I, I'd have to think about it, to yeah. be honest with you. That, that's really what the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission is there for. Mm -hmm. And they have a staff of people that are really mm -hmm. good. And, you know, I used to manage those folks, so I know a whole bunch of them. And um, I would encourage you to, to you contact them. You can get a contact with some people. Mm -hmm. Can I recommend some people? Yeah, yeah, you will. Uh, to yeah, help yeah. Us go yeah. 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 Ye
I'm sorry, I have to run. Yeah. But thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you all for yeah. taking the time. Yeah, so that was really good news. And Mass DOER did quite a good job with their little event. Southwick, East Long Meadow, Washington, Washington Mass, and Hadley uh, were the towns um, that got the award. And if you go to their website, you can see what towns are and are not on. But we'll have four of these signs to post around town. Thank Thanks, Chris. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. All right. Um, Catalina, did you or Kathy want to say anything about the composting? Yeah, we have right here beautiful postcards. Um, oh, those are great. Yeah, and we have a big banner that I send you that information. We have Where are the dimensions again? 11 by? 12, I think. 12, 12, 12 by 4. OK. Yes. So um, if you turn it around, you have a wonderful information about how important it's uh, composing. No, I haven't heard back. Okay. <laughs> I've got a whole pot. Oh, you have a okay. whole pot. Good. Thank you. Yes. And I will put some here if you want to, to, to take it. Um, the important thing is the information in the back about how composing is such a simple uh, act that we can do. and uh, they, the impact that is huge, huge, uh, for reducing um, the gases, the green, um, the, the um, well, especially methane. Yeah. Yeah. If if someone could read it aloud, because my my, my English is not very good, so <laughs> can anyone read it around? Go ahead. All right. <laughs> Reducing food waste is one of a few climate solutions that cost almost nothing but deliver massive financial as well as environmental benefits. The carbon footprint of the U.S. food waste is greater than that of the airline industry. Globally, wasted food counts for about 8% of all greenhouse gas emissions. The environmental consequence of producing food that no one eats a massive, and that's taken from the Washington Post. According to a new study in the Nature Journal Scientific Reports, composting food scraps results in 38 to 84 percent fewer greenhouse gas emissions than tossing them into a landfill. So it's a huge, if everybody we can be, convince everybody to do this, we can really help a lot. And where did the funding for this come from? This one come from the Massachusetts Cultural Council and the Hadley Cultural Council, Amherst Cultural Council, and um, um, we uh, thanks to Kathy. The RDP. The RDP. We, we were able Grant. to print this. We are going to have a huge banner in the transfer station, a time trying to tell everybody. And we have the composting over there. So just bring your waste food over there and hopefully uh, we will be producing a lot of gases. And where are you going to put the postcards? Um, all uh, all public places, library, maybe we can do a senior center, um, the town, the police station, over there also in the, in the place. Um, and we have some stands that we are going to put in front of the, uh, where the compost bin is, so that people be aware that that's happening. And in, in Hadley, in Amherst, I already put it in Northampton. So okay. if anyone can help to put it around and pass it around, um, hopefully the, the post office allow us also to put it over there. So. Um, the postcards? The, yeah. yeah, the postcards, right, yeah. right, right. Thank you both yeah. for doing this. Yes. Kathleen did it. Right. Be here in half an hour. Yes. So oh, we, we can switch. Yeah, and I have you go. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, one more thing. All the fo pictures right here are local artists, uh, all, all local photographers, and all of them are, it's Hadley, uh, this is, except this one. This is not <laughs> yes. All right, to set the stage for this, um, we talked about sort of ramping up the resilience building side of our work as opposed to just doing the mitigation side, and so, um, a little bit like Chris, this is what I do for a living. Um, so I just put together a few slides of um, sort of some ideas of what we could do to get there. And I, I want to say adaptation planning or resilience planning um, in big cities is a whole different kettle of fish than doing it in a small town like ours with so limited capacity. 
So a lot of what needs to happen, I think, needs to be integrated with ongoing work of the town. Um, and I will just quickly say, um, Carolyn um, contacted me to be part of a conversation with the Army Corps of Engineers about the flooding thing. They want to start a whole outreach campaign to the town to inform people about the yeah. risks of, of flooding in town. That's good. So, okay. you know, that's not yet upgrading the levy, but it is connected to that. She effort. contacted you? Yes. Right. Um, I'm going to be out of town for the first or for this next meeting, but I will yeah. continue to be part of that. So, um, but that's, you know, eventually that will be a public effort, and whatever I'm describing here needs to be coordinated with all of that. I think, right. you know, we, we don't have the capacity to run multiple things in parallel. Carolyn should be all in on it. Um, so this is, anyway. So what I want to just say is, is a little bit sort of the basics of um, what Chris just described. You know, what do people do in adaptation planning? How do they get there? Um, the typical process is, you know, you, you'll see a thousand pictures like that that start with identifying the risks. What, what are we exposed to? What are we going to do about it? Making it happen, seeing if it works, and then, you know, revising that strategy. And at the center of all of that is the stakeholder engagement, which is probably the one thing that Hadley has the least capacity for to bring everybody on board on a regular basis to hear from everybody whether their mm. concerns, their needs, their visions for the future. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's really important. Um, and in the process of developing a planning um, or, or selecting and, and looking at, at options, I think we actually ought to combine that with thinking about where do we want Hadley to be in, say, in a generation from now. You know, it's not just about climate change. How can we meet all kinds of goals that Hadley has because we don't have capacity to do all these things in silo bins and, you know, then they're not coordinated. So, um, and I'm happy to share the slides with you. Um, so, you know, what that I think entails is to hear from everybody, what do they want to keep, right? What's lovely about Hadley? What do we want to keep? And what is maybe not as great and how do we want to change that to move to in a better direction? Um, so it's really a conscious effort of moving and, and checking whatever else we do in reference to that shared vision of where we want to go. And of course, you know, at the same time, trying to keep going as things become as disruptive as we've seen. Um, and so I think what that means is and, and I say that because it, it sort of is the rationale for what I want to propose to us, is really learning about what's coming, how might that affect Hadley, so that's looking at the risks, ensuring that we're prepared for it, developing this vision, and building the capacity amongst us to do it. You know, not everything has to be done by the town. Everyone in, the, in every household, every school, every institution, Every business can help do that, right? Farmers need to do it already. Um, so this is, you know, basically the process um, of, of what we can help with. Because Hadley doesn't have, you know, the single planner who, like him, <laughs> who can take all this on, um, how do we spread the capacities around or how do we involve the community to help that process along? And I'm drawing here on something that comes from uh, a, an association of um, community-driven resilience planners or community resilience planners, which, you know, basically the, in the simplest version, the, the help that they provide is what's the vision, um, what solutions do we like? You know, it, I mean, yes, there are engineers and, and technical experts who can, you know, put in front of you a whole bunch of ideas, but... How, does, how do we make it work for us, right? So that's really important. And then also building capacity um, to pull that off. And, and that's both being politically engaged, but also um, being engaged in, in making these things happen. So this is a slightly more complicated version of that that um, shows the different um, steps in the process. So the visioning, identifying, you know, what are the issues? It's not just climate change that the experts can tell us about. It's also what other things are not going well. Do we have enough housing? Do, you know, whatever. I mean, all these issues, right, that, that uh, concern the town, bringing everyone's voices in in assessing it, not just having a consultant do the business. I mean, that they might be really helpful, and we can get grants from MVP to help us develop those, but there are things people see because they live here and from their particular perspective, and we would miss that if we didn't bring the voices in 
and the um, and the same around the solutions. Like, you know, what might work if someone says, "Oh, why don't we do tree boxes?" Well, <laughs> you know, someone who lives in those in the context of that neighborhood might say, "You know, that that's what doesn't work, and here's why." And on the you know, in yeah, the books, we definitely you might, need to know more about tree boxes. Well, it's just one example, yeah. right? But but it's uh, other things too. Yeah. Uh, whether it's rain gardens or whether it's where the culverts should go, whatever. All of that is sort of a, a combination of enhancing what a technical consultant might do with what people who live here see and live in and want to see happen all the time. You know, it's interesting you mentioned that the new Zaturka Park has a couple of rain swales. And when they were first built and put in, it's like, when would they be used? <laughs> They've been filled so much of the summer. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the beautiful thing about green infrastructure, that it actually works 24-7 and has benefits 24-7, not just during an extreme event, but of course that's when they're most useful. But, you know, we enjoy rain gardens and, you know, whatever, those kinds of things all the time. Now, in this instance here, in, in this particular um, model that I'm using here, they're actually suggesting that the community shape how planning gets done. And I'm not sure that actually is going to uh, fly in Hadley. I don't know. You can tell me otherwise. But my hunch is that at the very least, we have to have um, really good working relationships with the Planning Commission, with the Conservation Commission, with, with everybody else who is involved in making these decisions. Because we can talk until the cows come home, and n nothing's going to happen if, we don't, if yeah. we don't work with the people who actually make those decisions. So that's a really key component. Now, generally, what happens in you know adaptation planning, resilience planning, is you know understanding the risk. What do we have to adapt to? Who or what will do it? Like I said, not every not everything has to be done by the town per se. Um, how does it happen? How do we make it happen? It's both technically, financially, you know, structurally, and then how good is it? Um, there are a lot of things one might suggest for climate adaptation that would be completely inappropriate for many other reasons that people might have. So that's what we call maladaptation, that it actually makes either that problem or another problem worse, and we wouldn't want to have that happen. So it's, it's really you know, thinking not just about what do we want to do, but also um, observing whether it's working. Now, I have a, a longer list than what we just heard from Chris about sort of you know, structural, regulatory, um, and outreach. These things that I listed here in blue are the kinds of things that um, either a town government or a regional entity or um, the state even can help make happen. You know, I, we don't have to go into the details. The stuff in red is a lot of stuff that households or volunteer committees like ours can do, right? The educational, informational part, um, the trust building to make it actually happen. Nothing happens, and I can tell you from everything I've ever researched on this, that this piece, the social and trust building, is the most important element of any adaptation. If it's not there, groups tend to not be able to make decisions in tough situations. Um, you know, any society in the past that's been through stress, whether or not they've managed to get through it or not, the, the fundamental factor is the social um, connection and trust building that made it happen or not. So that's something we can definitely help with. And then there are things that might not happen here, like you know, inventing new ways to build culverts mm -hmm. or you know, in coastal areas, how to build adaptable infrastructure, those kinds of things. That, that, that's not in our yeah. um, bailiwick, but that's something that you know, happens and we can draw on. Now, I think good starting places is both the hazard mitigation plan, which I think the last time was 2016, was it updated? Um, and that was five years after the, the one before, so I don't know if it's up for. Well, that was Irene in 11. That yeah. Lost. Yeah. So maybe, I don't know what would trigger an, an update to it, but I read it actually again, and there's a lot of things in there that are a little outdated as far as climate change is concerned. So, um, like, for example, there's no risk that we have from heat, which I think is change. <laughs> well, that's change. Uh, something we might want to um, definitely realize. Anyway, um, and then there was this previous MVP effort, right, where there was some community workshops, so it was before my time, I don't know if you were involved in it, but it was basically 
um, a workshop that looked at some of the similar issues that, that we now look, need to look at and came up with a whole bunch of ideas and I think only the levy idea is being taken forward, nothing else has happened. So we should start from these things and then build up from there so that we need to not reinvent the wheel. Um, uh, and have you also has a master plan yes, in sir. place? So that's exactly what I, you know, I didn't have access yeah. to those um, this afternoon and didn't look at them carefully, but, you know, there might also be public health issues or um, the, you know, how do, where do we preserve land and what's the plan to the Conservation Commission. So there are probably more than relevant plans that I don't know and emergency management we might hear about. But all of these things, I think, are good base, base documents or places to start from. And this is also where I think this is where we integrate into, as opposed to, you know, eventually coming up with um, a climate resilience plan or something. Why not just integrate it right into all these documents that people already look into, and that's where they, that's so that's, that's then the what they do. That we use yeah. To okay. yeah. And you know, we might find there are some things we don't. I don't know yet, but maybe there are things that these plans don't cover that we might say, you know, there ought to be some additional document or whatever, wherever it goes, depends on what it is. But at least I think these are good starting places. The other thing, and that relates to um, the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, is they also developed a climate action plan for resilience in particular in 2014, I believe. And I think because it is such an important capacity builder for us as a town, we need to at least be coordinated with them and speak to the same issues and see what they already have, you know, are doing in those areas. And then go, you know, if we feel like there's more, then go above. And I'll, I'll show you one example. So Susie, this can is, you say more? Is, was that done for like the whole valley? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, it, hmm. and what it basically has, it has, you know, a whole bunch of things on climate action and clean energy. And what, what that means is, is the mitigation side as he defined it you know, the reducing so the our impact on the climate. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. But it also looked at food security, something we have, you know, we don't, for example, in Hadley have any, any document that looks at that. You know, we assume that we will have enough food. Well, there, <laughs> there actually some... was when the Senior Center survey went around. There is oh, there in go. there about food insecurity. Oh, yeah. Well, so there you go. And, you know, there might be not just sort of poverty-driven food insecurity, but um, food, in food insecurity because of climate change. Right. So um, transportation, environment, green infrastructure, housing, and brownfields and land use are the eight groups that they look at. There's nothing on health, which I think is a big missing factor, yeah. for example. Um, so, you know, we, we can put into our plan or whatever we want to come up with, any other issues we think are important for Hadley. Um, you know, this doesn't have really anything on businesses, but business um, resilience and preparedness for disasters is really important. It's a key aspect of our town. So, you know, those are the kinds of things that where I would say we can deviate, we can go above and beyond and do more than what is there. So what I think is needed is to kind of, you know, we're not all of us are professionally doing this on a regular basis, so and we don't have any funding yet to do this. So there is something that this committee, though. Can you bring it back? It'll up? come back. That oh, will. Oh, sorry about that. No, that's okay. I think you just need to wait up your machine. I moved this thing. Oh, yeah, there you go. go. Sorry <laughs> about that. Um, this committee, I think, can really help with um, the educational component and getting people aware of what's happening and educating ourselves. And then once we get to the place of really concretely, you know, here's, here's what we need, here are the actions, then we go to wh whoever that, you know, does it need engineers, does it need policy, does it need whatever, we don't know, right? So the first um, goal, I would say, is that we educate ourselves and, and others about, you know, what the risks are, and, and also learning about what the other concerns and needs are. Like, you know, food insecurity, that's, that's an issue that I think we should just bring, bring right into this as opposed to having that be a separate issue. Sustainability is, is on all these issues. In the process, really trying to understand how big of a challenge is it? Um, what are the possibilities of dealing with that? And again, not at the level of having technical solutions, but at least 
this is acceptable, this is not acceptable, this is what we need to pay attention to. And what I would suggest is that we take very, very careful notes as we move forward on this, because that's going to be the, the fodder for the next grant to the MVP program, right? This is basically where we do the scoping for whatever we want to go for for grants. So this is what this is intended to do. You know, at least identifying the elements of what do people want? Where are we going? Um, what, is, what is our vision for Hadley? And in the process, making the connections to not just the sort of climate typical folks, but you know any other like we, you were talking the other day about um, Hadley Learns, right? That could they could be a partner, but they might be the cultural council, like mm -hmm. you know the senior, uh, senior, uh, what, whoever, the schools. Like who do we need to have in on this to essentially pull this off? Mm -hmm. um, so those would be my, my proposed goals. And the way I, I'm sort of thinking about this is for the rest of 2023, there's a whole bunch of things we can do. One is to explore this partnership with Hadley Learns, um, who could act as facilitators um, of this process. And the, the way I envision it is that we have a series of public meetings, maybe every month one or, or something, um, and that they would be facilitating the dialogue. You know that could, we can help with identifying speakers, like you know what Chris was talking about. You know a few every time on the topic that we mm -hmm. want to talk about. But then there's a dialogue we want to have happen. If we want to know what are the issues, what's the vision, you know. Mm -hmm. So having someone help us do that, um, because of you know the conversations I've ha been having with Carolyn, I think it's really important to have regular conversation and communication with Carolyn to and and the select board probably. To I would I would do it jointly with select board. Okay. Make, this committee can make presentations to the select board or a committee from the select board. Say I would like to be on the agenda. We need twenty minutes or whatever. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So let's work that out. It, I mean, this is just all draft here, right? Um, also, building relationships with the other commissions. I put the Planning Commission here as a really important one, but the Conservation yeah. Commission or whoever else you think are important, relevant Probably both, because they're both going to bring a and different of pers yep. yeah. perspective to whatever the so, topic is. So it, let, I'll just update all that to, in, to include Conservation those. Conservation Commission can figure That's out. That's probably why Deerfield in that, in that committee he was talking about, like they pulled from each... I think board. basically what we're talking about here is, is developing that MVP core group, right, that's you know, right. like building up mm -hmm. something right. I think um, that, that, you know, that is... I think is a good model yeah. for us. And also I think, um, so I have, and, and Chris can help us with too, but I have context too at the Planning Commission, um, the PV Planning Commission, so um, they have people who are really working on the energy side and people who work on the resilient side. Mm -hmm. And, you know, having that regional connection I think is really important um, because you know we will not manage the Connecticut River all by ourselves right whatever happens upstream is going to affect us down here and we affect whatever you know people downstream so all the members of this committee know we have already met with um, the green community group and Chris Mason out of this area as well as Pioneer Valley Planning Commission and we have a sequence of when there's an idea for some of the monies that we receive or grants we apply to, how things will be sequenced, who is involved, so we have that organized. So we're not just putting forth ideas that won't meet the green community's criteria or won't meet the needs of the town. So that's how we were able to work with Gary Berg and take a look at some of the air conditioning needs for the town hall and look at some of the weatherization needs for the schools. So it's a good example of the benefits of working with that regional group and I think it, that there is sort of a, a similar kind of conversation or type of help that we can get for the resilient yeah. side of things. Kelly? Um, I was just curious, where are those notes kept? Where, oh, how, oh how, um, how we Annie that? McKenzie, the superintendent of our schools, actually have that notes and she's created a file i can send you pictures of that that would be great i'll actually do that right now i might good i'll be almost done here so um so the other piece then is you know identifying relevant partners on all the issues areas that i'm going to talk about in a moment and there might be others that you guys um, think of 
um, and, and then starting to plan for this sort of series, whatever it would take to pull it off probably here in the senior center um, makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I would also say, you know, bringing our state reps on board um, and the, bo the select board and, you know, whoever else and, and starting to advertise for this in the town. Um, yeah. And sort of the, the topics that now this is, this is, you know, a, a matrix here, just, you know, the topics really are the ones that are in the ag farms, forest, health structures, businesses, water, sewage, railroad, i.e. transportation, ecosystems and energy. And by energy, I, I don't mean now emission reduction. I mean that the energy infrastructure itself is at risk from being impacted by mm. climate. Right, um, mm. like the electrical events. lines, exactly, so, yeah. or yeah. communication lines, and right. all yeah. the, or you know, storage, um, energy storage facilities, right. right, in the floodplain. You know those kinds of things, right? And then on the on the top is like all the kinds of risks that are already in the hazard mitigation plan that are you know expected to be an issue even though I feel like they're a little out of date. But the point is, they're already in there, and we can use those as sort of, you know, how are those types of events affecting um, these sectors, these issue areas? And, you know, maybe there's other things, cultural institutions, I don't know. This is not a complete list. It's just my starting list, you know, and we can probably fill a whole year with these mm -hmm. kinds of events. But the point for me would be to, to get enough ideas out of these public dialogue meetings mm -hmm. where people learn, people connect with each other, learn what the issues are and you know get a sense of what people care about so that we can start to develop um, grant proposals when uh, over the course of 2024 there will be periods when grant proposals are due to mm -hmm. get grants to come in to actually take the actions to make it happen. Mm -hmm. So anyway. Thank that's you. sort of the yeah. that's the basic idea. Thank you so much. Okay. So for together. other members of the committee, what are your initial reactions to this idea? You're going to share these with us. I'm happy yeah. to yes. send yeah. them around. Yes. Yeah. So see if you could send them to me. I'll post them up on the website. Yep. That'd be great. Um, they're in the notes on the website. And I'll update the the <laughs> things on the on this slide here with Planning Commission, Conservation Commission, yeah. and Health Board, awesome. whatever. Thank you. Yeah. So your timing couldn't be much better, Mike. I'm following <laughs> okay, the conversation that we've been having um, today. We had Chris Curtis come in from um, Deerfield. And he had lots of ideas to share. It seems they're very forward-looking on some of this. Um, but I think there's many people here and in the town in general who have some big questions. And some of them relate to emergency services and sort of your overarching umbrella. Um, and some of them might be smaller scale. Um, you know, however you want to start sort of telling the story, I, I know I have a couple of specific questions, but go for it. Um, sorry, could you introduce yourself? Uh, yes, I don't know you. Sorry. I mean, <laughs> My name is Michael Spaniel. I'm the fire chief in Hadley okay. and also the emergency management director. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I mean, just coming behind what you were just talking about as far as grants and um, looking at stuff, your, some of your stuff with floods and storms and everything, um, and our mitigation plan, which we are waiting for our federal money to come in to update that. Oh, so we've been approved. We're just waiting for the paperwork. And oh, it's great. been a long wait. So, so who is, does that? Approve and for get the money. Who's so when we do that, there's, uh, there's a committee that's put together, and normally it's myself, the police chief, um, Another member of the fire department, select board, Somebody outside. From this committee absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So we can, the select board have the, you know, you can put together wherever you want. Okay. And then there's multiple public hearings along with that too. There's, I believe, three different public hearings. So going through updating the information in that plan, uh, identifying new new goals and objectives, which certainly would love to have. So this is all the MVP that you're talking no, about? No, the is hazard different. mitigation. This okay. is hazard mitigation, okay. and this, we need this in order. This one. In order to apply for. Um, gotcha. In order to apply for federal, uh, some of the federal federal grants, you need to have that that plan yeah. in place and updated. Yeah. So that's why we're hoping that funding will come in soon. We requested twenty five thousand, has to go out for procurement. Uh, you know, we last time we did it, we had Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. Uh, they've done the last two of them for us. Uh, not to say that they're the only ones who do it, but they do a, a really nice job with it. Um, so. And they would be c climate change cognizant, so that's yeah. helpful. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. I was just wondering, is this $25,000 to do actual work or to do a study or? This is to actually update the plan. So it it's, doesn't pay for the staffing on our side. It pays for the, the planner. planning commission. So putting together, we put to, together new mapping. Um, so it's kind of, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty lengthy process to get it done. So this sounds like a few steps into already what you were talking about. Yeah, that's. And probably some uh, more people in town need to get on that, you know, on it. Well, with you guys. They did it before, so they sort of have a, a there's a process to it that's yeah. prescribed, basically. So we identify the main hazards. So it's the main hazards in town. So our main hazards are floods. We look at, um, you know, wind and rain events. We get, you know, we get some pretty good storms. Uh, not so much the tomato, uh, tomatoes, tornadoes. <laughs> <laughs> um, not so much tomatoes this year, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although that risk is increasing too. Yeah. But microbursts. Uh, you know, these heavy wind events that come up really quickly. Um, that kind of stuff. Some of those these winter storms have become quite aggressive and scary for us. Uh, we've we've been working really hard to harden our infrastructure. Uh, at the police and fire departments. Um, we have redundant, uh, basically the generator that we had, you know, five years ago was original to the building, kept failing on us. Uh, so we were losing our ability to, you know, to even receive 911 calls. So we did improve that. We got a new generator, but we also have dual fuel. So if we lose our natural gas line, we have a propane backup that can run our, our generator for multiple days. Um, we also uh, assisted in getting one here at the mm -hmm. senior center, so you are, you have generated power here as well with the, uh, propane. And we're the heating and cooling center. And it, yep, and then also the new north station is also a listed heating and cooling and center. And is the library also a heating and cooling center? No, no, okay. uh, they don't have generated power. Okay. Uh, this one, this this space was more conducive because they have they have a small nursing area. They have, they have a, kitchen. a kitchen. The kitchen is huge when you're talking about, you know, we could even open this as a shelter if we needed to. Um, that's why we put the, you know, the, the generator in. The north station is kind of a, a short term, but if we had to in an emergency, we could put people into the bay. We designed it so there's radiant floor heat. So if it's in the, in the winter time, there's, you know, heat that stays really, it stays really comfortable in that space if we have a set of cots. There's showers, there's you know bathrooms, there's bunk rooms, there's cooking facilities there as well. Um, so we did harden the town quite a bit. Do either of the schools or both of the schools qualify? Uh, the elementary school is one of our one of our shelters. Uh, we actually learned in uh, it was that snow over event we had on mm -hmm. Halloween. Yeah. Uh, that the generator that they have over there was actually only providing limited power to emergency exit lighting and real limited uh, infrastructure and stuff inside the building. We were fortunate that the the main grid was turned back on because we were about a day away from having to relocate Golden Court, uh, Winfield Senior Housing, Family Housing, all into shelters. But luckily, you know, Eversource focuses on Route 9 and all of those trunks actually um, support this, this building and then also um, the, the Hadley Elementary in Hopkins, so we were fortunate. We did open it up as a warming and cooling center, or I should say a warming center at that point, but also so folks could start charging batteries, charging their phones, and we ended up having Halloween there for the kids because we didn't want the kids <laughs> on the road, so that worked out well. So you mentioned about winter storms, microbursts, floods. Yeah. Um, how about brush fires? Brush That's fires it? are also on that list. Um, I'm, I'll knock on wood, we've been fortunate, but uh, we were extremely concerned, you know, two years ago with that drought that we had. Last year. Uh, or last year. Um, uh, we were monitoring, monitoring pretty heavily uh, just because of the, we've, we've had some pretty extensive uh, wildland fires on the Skinner Mountain uh, that are close to impacting residential structures on Chamorro Road. Uh, but we were fortunate enough. Uh, they've, been, they've been trying to keep up clearing pathways and, and trying to reduce fire load there. Uh, but, you know, we were, we were concerned. Has Hadley ever had to call in the state uh, the state police department to do any water drops or no? Yes. Uh, so uh, I don't even remember what year it was, but we were out there for two weeks, mm -hmm. and we were using Lithia Springs to reload, okay. and also the upper reservoir, uh, and we did have state police's their bag dropping water. Um, that was a two-week process. The 
the fire had gotten probably 12 inches into the ground, so it was as soon as we put it out, it would start oh, up as soon as we walked away. So it was a long process until we got some rain. Leverett had to call in the stays last year. Yes, they did. Their fire. Actually, we were at that fire as well. That was pretty substantial. Mm -hmm. um, all the events are listed in the in the hazard mitigation plan. We're also part of uh, so all of the fire departments in Hampshire County are part of a state fire mobilization plan. So we actually get called out to other communities. Uh, there would be, for example, we went to Athol for a pretty serious brush fire. So we partner up with them. If we need them, they come to us. If not, we go to, the, to them. So we could actually be going out to a different county uh, to assist, and we've done that numerous times. And those those systems are set up so if we get overwhelmed, we can bring we can bring those resources in. So we didn't just call you in to bombard you with questions, <laughs> but we have quite a few of them from Catalina, Kelly, Kathy, Susie. Do you have questions that come up? No, you did a really good job of explaining what it's about. I do have one other thing for you because we just actually met last week, but. We're actually working with the Army Corps of Engineers, which is also Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. Uh, I don't, you probably remember a, a number of years ago, we had the failure on the West Street levee system. Mm -hmm. uh, they had to replace about a 600 foot section of it. And then during that process, as they were lifting it, the new lift actually failed. And so we were actually exposed to a pretty scary situation because it was right as springtime was coming in when we get our yeah. normal high water. So we had put together some pretty substantial plans to evacuate the West Street, uh, the north end of West Street, which is doesn't happen, uh, mm -hmm. you know, because of that system. Uh, but that was a little bit of a scary time. So uh, I don't know if you've heard of the Army Corps engineers, but they're they have this group called the Silver Jackets. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we've been working with them, and we'll be rolling out pretty soon. We're going to be doing some public. Uh, outreach just to let people know where we're at. So do you have any do you have any timeline on that because we've heard some different things over the last year or so. It's going to be a little while because we have we're kind of putting the plan together right now like we just met and there was some delay on their side they had some stuff come up that they were dealing with so uh, we're hoping sometime I believe they were talking about the fall of trying to get some smaller groups together to start just spreading the word uh, getting information out to residents on you know how to how to so prepare your go bag like and town forums. Well, this is precisely what mm -hmm. I mean by coordinating, right? right. Yeah. So being in touch with Carolyn or you know and you directly, whatever. Um, I mean that's the process she asked yeah. me to be part of. Yeah. To to help develop sure. the plans for that and and yeah. I think they need to be integrated so that we don't do them. But thought. your well, hope we need is to know what each other are up to. Your hope is fall twenty twenty three. I believe that's what they were saying. Like I said, we have we have some pretty substantial plans in place already, and we've done some substantial outreach just as part of that last failure. Um, but you know, there's always mm -hmm. new folks coming into town. There's more people that want to hear about it. During our last flooding event, we had I had people calling from Amherst and Belchertown asking if they were going to be okay, and, you know, mm -hmm. thinking that you know this this was going to impact them. Mm -hmm. um, well, so, you know, as fast as you can say Maui. And you yeah. saw the yeah. fire no. that spread over yeah. the yeah. city yesterday. Yeah. That was stunning. Um, and I think it's a great concern. And I wonder, this. so this is a deeper question. Um, I'm still waiting to hear an answer on the coordination of the dams around water release. Thank you for that. Well, on that. Uh, yes. Yeah. Actually, the Army Corps brought that up as well. And oh, thank you. Um, I can tell you during this last flooding event, it was a little bit hairy, but uh, we did just, like I said last week when we met with the Army Corps, we were fortunate. There's a, there's a young lady that came in who actually explained some about these releases. So the Army Corps owned dams, so they're still private dams as well. But for the Army Corps, they, their intention is to never inundate downstream. They're, they're, they want to manage. And I received a phone call and an email like 7 o'clock in the morning saying you need to get onto a onto a, uh, web, a Zoom meeting with us. And it was just, it was Hadley, Hatfield. And I'm like, oh no, what's going on? <laughs> you know, we were already seeing the river coming up. And basically they told us that the um, one of the dams up in Vermont was going to have to, mm -hmm. they were starting to go into spillway. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently that was misinformation, so they, the, mm -hmm. that was misspoken. And she, she really explained to, to us how this whole thing works with 
a drop of water in this, this area where they're holding water back and how much water you would need to have drop out of the sky all at once to inundate and overflow that dam and it was astronomical. Like, it, I mean, not to say that it couldn't ever happen, but when we got on the phone call, the Army Corps said, yep, no, we're going to be fine. We're not releasing any water like we thought we might have to. And we will not release or allow water to flow that will bring you up above flood stage at Montague Center, which is what we look at upstream of us when we have a flood event. And the Turners Falls Dam? Yeah, Montague okay. Center is, is the one okay. where they have uh, the gauge. Called that area. Okay. So, so that was good news. And because we were, at the time, we were looking at I think it was the sixth or seventh highest flood height. Uh, the last one that I had dealt with was in 2011 with Hurricane Katrina, uh, Irene. I mean. mm -hmm. And we had a height of 217.2. And that brought us up pretty close. We had pre-planned for sandbagging and we dumped sand at the Aquavita at Bay Road site because that's where it comes over mm -hmm. first and starts flooding the Western Common. Um, that we didn't end up going over and they were projecting 217.9 for this storm. And then when we heard that they potentially would be letting water out, um, we very quickly made sure we had you know, trucks ready to go and sandbags filled. Uh, luckily we didn't, and we ended up seeing about 215.7, which was, which was better, still flooding down in the Aquavita and Honeypot areas, but... Um, and, in North Hat it. and in North Hadley, it was yes. quite a bit. Well, yes. along. Yeah. All, yep. all the so, overflow, yeah. Well, so you have the contact of with whom you will have that information from up the stream, all yep. the dams? That they have, um, and, and this is the information that we would put out for everyone as well, but it's called Northeast River Forecast. Okay. Okay. And basically if you click on that, it's under the National Weather Service, or NOAA, you can actually see all the gauges along the Connecticut River. So I have a question. I mean, the upstream dams definitely come into play, but what about Holyoke? I mean, if they're holding, if they don't release water, then that's it's backing up to us, right? It's it's overflowing. It's overflowing them. So it's not really. It's not that they're holding it back. Um, they're releasing it, but they're also trying to manage as well downstream. Well, that's them. what I mean. That so all the dams need to be. Working well, together, I would think, not just upstream, but downstream. Yeah, not. I don't normally worry too much about Holyoke, and in this event, there really wasn't a massive surge um, in the Holyoke, in the, at that Holyoke Dam. No, um, I meant we so. might get a lot of water if they're holding water back. Yeah, we're not, that water's not being stopped, so okay. they're, they're going to see that okay. impacting their area, not yeah, ours. Okay. So, um, well, this was just an interesting event. I, you know, the other day the Gazette had the story that of all the towns, Conway, all the towns mm -hmm. in the world, Conway had the most rainfall in July. Yep. You know, that was stunning. You know, there's mm -hmm. other places where you're going to be kidding. Conway actually yeah. had the most. That was the biggest difference as it impacted. So you had localized, like, street flooding and you know actually tearing apart streets so small tributary streams that were just completely inundated with this massive amount of water that dropped there so again it takes usually a day or two for us to start seeing the extreme water coming from vermont yeah. so we you normally we have some time to plan we do have instances where uh there was one october where we had all our pumpkin our entire pumpkin patch went down the river because we had close to two feet of water within like three to five hours. And it was, it just completely washed everything out up in urine, you know, in North Hadley and just cleared all those fields out. All the boats were impacted. Um, you saw what happened with sportsmen's at this last event. Right. They, they did get all their boats out, but they didn't have to get the docks out. Um, and you saw Brunel's Marina, yeah. how badly that was impacted. But we actually went, uh, we checked with uh, Mitch's Marina. Yeah. They have, they have a plan, so yeah, they, they had everything care. out. Mm -hmm. We went door to door on, like we do for every one of these storms, on Honeypot, Aquavita, checked in with everybody. They all have, they don't want to leave. Uh, mm -hmm. We've made it very clear that we will come get them up until we can't get a truck down their street anymore. Uh, but they have to understand that once that happens, they're on their own. Um, so we check in with all of them. We give them our, our contact number. So if they do have an emergency, we will we'll figure something out if we can. But they have to understand that it's, it's going to be a challenge. And, 
you know, please, if you if you want to consider it, maybe you should move out of the area for. Do you for still have the boat, the dive team, like you used to? We have, we do have our boat. We have actually two boats. One of our firefighters is actually part of the tech rescue team. Okay. So we're fortunate to have a, a state asset in our community. It's a, a Swift River boat, uh, which he deploys. And actually, he went to two of those calls. Uh, uh, there was up in Gill. He had to deploy. Somebody decided to try to go swimming and got caught up in the the buoys there. Uh, and then there was one other incident where he had to get the boat up there pretty quickly uh, to do some rescues. Um, but other than that, yes, we do have our boat. We don't have a dive team. State police are our dive team, and there is a regional dive team that includes South Hadley, Northampton, a bunch of other communities around us, and we support them with our boat. So um, if we had to, we could, we could get out there. So do you feel that you have good communication with other areas about what's happening? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. We have continuous, uh, there's continuous call-ins if we know this kind of storm is coming. Oh, that's so, awesome. you know, we're getting into hurricane season now, so we're watching, watching the Atlantic to see what's coming across, and, you know, every once in a while we start getting into some heightened awareness and start thinking about what we're, we might have to plan for. Uh, we do have our Nixel system, our, it's our reverse 911 system, where we can notify you if, if we hear something, but we only do it if it's an emergent situation. We don't want to inundate because everybody gets so many robo calls and mm -hmm. we don't want you to start feeling, oh, another call to tell me that there's the town just meeting. Hang on, not listening. Yeah. yeah, so we want to make sure that that's strictly How just for that. How many people are signed up for that? What percentage approximately? Uh, we've done some pretty big outreach, especially with our senior population, right. but um, we have the, so the emergency portion has the ability to do cell phones, text messaging, and then the emergent portion will also hit any leftover landlines. So if there's any landlines still, um, it will call those. And I believe we had about, I think we reached about 1,477 people the last time I did one. So friends, I, I, I don't know if I have, I'm connected with you or with that. So how, I, I believe that would be something that we should encourage everybody, everybody to join. Well, everybody and it could be part it. of that outreach campaign. Yeah, that, yeah. You know, yeah. Right. Um, right. So yeah, it's on it the town website. Yeah. The yeah. website you yeah. can sign it's under emergency notifications on the town website. Right. You just yeah. put your information in and we'll bring that pick whichever ones yeah. you want. Um, so another question uh, that has come up, um, and I don't know where it stands for zoning, for planning, for all sorts of reasons, but the discussion around the solar storage in um, the the gravel bank next to Zaturka Park. Um, yep. I'm just wondering, do you have the equipment you would need in case any of those batteries started on fire? So lithium battery storage is, is a big topic for fire, the fire service, and it's not so much these bigger storage facilities, because usually we can manage it, it's just standing there and watching, I hate to say it, but you're standing there watching it burn and managing anything around it. Mm -hmm. um, I personally don't have an issue with it being in, in that area. Um, we actually were one of the first towns, everybody was waiting for us to figure out how we were going to protect one. The University of Massachusetts at the central heating plant, they installed a one megawatt uh, lithium battery storage right next to their central heating plant, you know, within a... So by the street. Mullen Center? Yes. Mm -hmm. And right next to their 38,000 gallons of liquid propane or yeah. liquid uh, gas that they that have. Smart. So, um, yeah. which is fine. So we, we actually, they, they stepped up with us uh, in, you know, with the build, the state building inspector, they installed a deluge system in their force. So it's a dry system, but we have the ability to hook our pumper up and just continuously flood with water if there's an incident. So I think they did a really good job about, you know, managing that. And then that's kind of become the standard practice now. So we've, I've had a couple conversations with a potential one over by the um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife. There's a big solar array over there. Okay. Uh, they were talking about putting into, and we were going to be managing it the same way. Uh, I don't know if that's still But still not happening. especially right next to a building or something, right? Next to a building is, uh, well, actually, to, to be honest, we have a lot of homes that are starting to see these little So I guess really storage. it's having that containment. Situation. Yes, so we've been trying to manage that. We've been trying to keep people to keep them in the garage. You have a higher rating in your garage area. Um, outside, if possible, the problem is because of hot and cold in New England, it, it's not as efficient, uh, which can be an issue. But 
these batteries can be a challenge, but it's more uh, poorly manufactured and um, we're seeing a lot of these hoverboards and the bikes and the, the vaping things where people are getting really hurt because they're these these yeah. these batteries the are just tiny bursting into flames, yeah. yeah, and they're they're violent. They react violent, and you don't you yeah. don't even have time to get out of the way of them. Um, so that's that's our biggest concern right now. So what would be put in the gravel bank would actually be like a collection of batteries as power reserve. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So it's um it's lithium, small little lithium cells packed into bigger boxes, packed into stacks, yeah. and then filling. Connex boxes, basically, or concrete storage boxes. Uh, so, I mean, very efficient. Each cell is monitored. Like I said, they these solar companies really they have it down. Like I said, I'm not really concerned about it. They they really watch every cell, the temperatures. They can shut those individual cells down mm -hmm. remotely. So, it's more these the home variety ones mm -hmm. that are we're just concerned because it's if you put it in your basement. And again, these lithium batteries in a Tesla battery system or Generac, they're really solid, but how much stuff does everybody have in their basements? So if we have a basement fire and it impacts those batteries, there's no way we're going to be able to stop that if those batteries start on fire. So that's the concern is where we're putting them. So that's what we're trying to manage. What do people do if they have a lithium battery fire in their house then? What about those fire blankets? Can you put that one? Do that, that is one option. The problem is uh, these the lithium batteries, depending on the type, they create their own oxygen. Yeah, and they just keep igniting. They just keep, they keep burning. So I, I just received a question from another chief in Aguam of if we have one of these lithium batteries go bad, what do we do with it? Because it's going to continue to burn, even if we put it out. And you put it into the waste bucket, it's going to start on fire again. Or if it's in a car and we send the car to the junkyard. So you have to somehow super suffocate it. Yes. So the hazmat team is we're working with the state hazmat team to figure out how we can we can manage these these things. So the other big thing is the photovoltaic system. So we we just adopted the new code of national the National Fire Prevention Association, and that we have solar on everybody's houses now, which is great. The problem is is the solar didn't really keep up, or we didn't have the opportunity to keep up with the solar manufacturers and the installations. So it's been, it's a challenge for us too, as a fire department, to manage a fire in your home when your entire roof is covered with solar panels. Well, so, uh, because of why? You because normally we vent we vent your roof uh, to get heat and, and fire out of it. Uh, the new code has provided with basically allowing for us to have pathways, which allows access at a minimum for us. Allowing more street access, we have access from the driveway side, um, and then also for commercial commercial properties because a lot of these commercial buildings are, you know, they're filling up their roofs as well. So it's well, a challenge for us. And so, yeah. also, even with the installation of solar, now they're putting breakers on the outside of the house, mm -hmm. where my original solar system had a breaker on the inside, yep. but now yep. it's been moved to the outside, so it's easier to shut it down. Yeah, we've been improved. It's been improved even the ability to shut them down. So the the way that the system used to shut down is the basically the panels would still be live and so we have to get up on the roof and try and work on a fire situation and there's still power being generated but the the new systems now actually shut each unit down which is huge oh, for us. Good. In your recollection have you been to a solar fire? I have uh, I've had we've had one small solar bat not not solar I shouldn't say solar it was a lithium battery fire but not a solar fire, no. Okay. Which is good. Yeah, that's <laughs> great. <laughs> right. Any other questions from the committee? Mm -hmm. What's the easiest way to, you know, stay coordinated with with what you guys are all working on in terms of, you know, if, if we're trying to sort of start this education campaign about climate risks and, you know, like, what's the best way for us to keep you in the loop or have you come in? I mean... Just let me know what you need, and I, if you have folks that want to be on that hazard mitigation team, we would welcome it, open arms, please. And we would love to get the word out with you just on the, the public safety side. We've, you know, we've gone out to, you know, the seniors and talked about to-go kits, you know, being ready for a storm. If you, you know, what you need to do, you, you may have to take care of yourself for, you know, three days before you get help. So we, whatever you need from us, we would... 
we would welcome anything, any help you could give us as well for, for outreach. Yeah, I'll do it. I'll be on there. Well, Susie definitely wants to be on it. Yeah, okay. I, yeah, I don't know how many people you can... Yeah, so yeah, maybe yeah. you should do it. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's as soon as we get, like I said, I don't know when. Yeah, I've, been, yeah. I've been hoping that the money would come a little bit quicker, but um, we, I mean, approved. we do. There's the good news. Yeah, it is approved, so hopefully soon. Yeah. So, I don't know, I'll... I'll find your email or I'll get it to you. Or gonna, yeah. Yep, it's on it's on the web the town website. Okay. Um, or just she yeah. has myself. Feel free. Have you, you know, been getting some of my emails? I just sent yes. you one or two. I apologize. Okay. No, no, no. I, no, that, I just wanted to make sure I had the right address. You have one of those challenging last names. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh come on! Who yeah. has challenging yeah, yeah. last names? Yeah, yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope you heard that. Um, have these now a green community. Mm -hmm. So that's I, I did hear that. good news. All right. Good. With this hundred thirty nine thousand dollars. Even better. Hundred and thirty nine dollars? Hundred and thirty nine dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so, All right. Yeah, Congratulations. Just one more little thing. <gasps> yep. Story. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah. Thank you for the invite. Yeah. Now you can go home again. Okay. All right. Thank <laughs> you. Thanks for coming in, Mike. Sure. Great. It's Susie, you're up. So the the one thing I need to say is that you know I'm going to be mostly gone for this fall, um, so I, I need someone to basically take on the sort of keeping the drum beat up on this and getting it coordinated. Um, I just I'm going to be on sabbatical and. What about going to their meetings? I I will you know when I'm in town and and they coincide I will do it. Um, I told Carolyn already, so she knows okay. about that, but anyway. Um, well, I think if you contact the two of us, we will do our best. If you not, can't be there, then you right. can. The, the part that they want right now is technical uh, advice, on, oh, you know, so, that so that's, why, th that's why she contacted me. Yeah. But there will be a part when it, it's like basically the public process, and you know, she wants everybody to be involved in that. No, but okay. I was talking about the speaker series. Oh yeah, we for can, that part, that, we can that, help with that. Because I, mean, I know you have a new obligation with the job. I, I do, but yeah. 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 And but I also think yeah. for different parts, different people can maybe take a lead. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. but yeah, maybe yeah. we can sort of turn yep. this into a bit of a plan before yeah. I leave. Thanks for what you came up with. That's, yeah, that's great. That's a really impressive first draft. All right. Um, nice to have someone who does it professionally. Yeah. <laughs> So last meeting, one thing that came up was about chemtrails. So I did a little research. I was looking for that um, movie, but I, I sort of struck out on it. I, I can look again, but it's one on thing YouTube. that... What? It's on YouTube. Uh, I know, but there's like a billion things on YouTube. You end up getting the guy speaking. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what I, I have looked around for one. What I found was this text from Harvard um, about chemtrails. And I put it on the agenda, um, you know, that's what they say about it. I know different people will say other things about it. Uh, this is now the session where we have some public comment, if anybody has it. I have a different topic. Sure. No. Um, um, I'm a geoengineering from Harvard. I did some, some research also. Yeah. And... Um, David Keith, the professor, is running and he's doing research on geoengineering. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's from Harvard. Right. There's geoengineering, the topic, from and it's different than chemtrails. Right. And um, he, they're also saying that uh, solar geoengineering may be surprisingly effective in alleviating impacts of global warming on crops. But that doesn't mean they are doing it. No, the research. Right. Right. Yeah. right. Um, and then I came across an article from the Washington Post, and it was um, the same professor from Harvard who calls anyone who thinks chemtrails could be real conspiracy theorists. And the reason why he's doing that is because the people that think chemtrails could... Uh, it could be real, could squash his research oh. and his funding from Bill Gates. 
Isn't that amazing? Yeah, well, it, you know, I have to say, so, spending a yeah. lot of time outside in the summer mm -hmm. every year, yeah. if somebody's doing chemtrails, they're doing a really lousy job. Well, because last year we had an epic drought, and this year it is just awful. This morning alone, we had to leave an acre of tobacco oh, yeah. because it was just it's devastated. Right. And we're actually able to cut almost everything unless it rains more tonight or Saturday night. Right. Um, I take pictures yeah. every time. If they do it in the sky, I take pictures every time. It really? isn't happening. It's just not happening. All right, but anyway. All right. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and there are yeah. different. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. There so. are different voices. Well, right, and that's why I just put it in. This was one voice from Harvard. You found a different voice from Harvard. I'm sure there's other voices. Harvard, from other Cornell, places. Yale. Yeah. They're all doing geoengineering, which is going to go into the stratosphere, and they're going to. Well, geoengineering can be a department. Like I'm an engineer no, from UMass. Geoengineering you know, is, is is the deliberate modification of the, of the weather, yeah. okay. and they want to do that eventually. And mm -hmm. even the um, Biden administration has a mandated research on that, and that came out in June. That's, can, can that's I just true, say, but they're not doing it yet. But no, can I just say that it. even David Keyes, who is a promoter of geoengineering research, actually is not a promoter of geoengineering research. Right. I, sorry, I, I, he's my colleague. I've known him for so many, many years. why is he doing it? Why is he doing it? Because, well, there are, you know, I, I'm not in agreement with him doing it, but he is basically saying that at some point it's going to get so uncomfortably hot that people will want to know about it and what they can do. And at that point, if we have no research, that's his argument, then, you know, then we're going to just futz around with the atmosphere as opposed to doing it maybe in an informed way, understanding the risks of doing it. That's mm -hmm. his right. whole idea. Right. I have my problems with David Keith, Keith, but, you know, him doing the research in models is a very different thing than a concerted effort of putting chemicals into Same the atmosphere on a daily basis. That's well, do, not happening. Do, um, what about the weather modification LLC? There is, I don't know what L... The, the, the yeah, weather I modification is happening and has happened since the 1950s Correct. on very small, sort of individual basis kind of thing. Yes. Geoengineering is a very different kettle of fish. Yes, I know. Yeah, I know. Okay. But I know other people have comments too. Um, I have something to say. Um, uh, decades ago, um, when I was at UMass, the Vietnam War had just ended. Numerous men from Hadley were drafted and sent to the military combat in Vietnam. Two citizens from Hadley were killed. There's a point to this. Two Hadley citizens were killed in Vietnam, and other ones, numerous other ones were messed up for life. The draft ended when I was a senior in high school. Friends of mine is in my class signed up for the draft because I was younger, yeah. um, and President Nixon ended the draft months before my birthday. Robert McNamara was in charge of the Department of Defense in the Johnson administration. Mm -hmm. They escalated the war. Over 52,000 Americans killed, were killed, plus the innocent Vietnamese sure. that were killed. Forty years later, McNamara, McNamara wrote an autobiography that the Vietnam War was wrong. The point that I'm making is, the point that I learned from UMass, question authority. That's all. Oh, that's, mm -hmm. that's true. Mm -hmm. Sure. Question authority. Mm -hmm. One should never take anything without questioning it. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. Yeah. And Susan? Okay. Um, in the spirit of balance, um, this morning, I somebody sent me something in the New York Post, and I made copies for everybody to read, and I'll be brief about it. This is dated August 10th, 2023. Scientist admits the overwhelming consensus on the climate change crises is manufactured. Climate scientist Judith Curry says climate change is a manufactured consensus. And I'm just in the spirit of openness and balance. She says scientists have an incentive to exaggerate risk to pursue fame and fortune. 
She knows about that because she once spread alarm about climate change. The researchers quickly figured out that the way to get funded was to make alarmist claims about man-made climate change. This is how manufactured consensus happens. Even if a skeptic did get funding, it's harder to publish because journal editors are alarmists. Alarmist scientists' aggressive attempts to hide data suggesting climate change is not a crisis were revealed in leaked emails. You can keep those copies, but I like to listen to all aspects of, of any topic. Yes, of yeah. well, I appreciate the well, open yeah. discussion this committee has allowed from the yeah. public. Um, part of this response was when I asked the question if the educating of ages K through 12 would be objective or subjective. Mm -hmm. And the answer was subjective, which I thought that was odd. I thought the answer would be, oh, of course it will be objective. So I am just presenting to you another viewpoint to take into consideration for any and all decisions you may make going forward. And who gave that reply? Uh, the senator, the state senator, Mindy, Mindy Dom. Representative. The representative, I'm sorry. The yeah, representative, yeah, yeah, Mindy right. Dom, what gave that answer. Response? I remember what she said. Yeah. It had to do, the, the idea was not that, you know, teachers would get to teach whatever facts they would like. Oh, it would be left up to them whether or not they wanted to go for the resources that this um, bill that she was yeah. um, putting forward, whether they would want to draw mm -hmm. on those resources. It and wasn't about you know, the cherry picking of data. I asked specifically, will the education of the children be objective or subjective? Fully expecting the answer to be objective. And she said subjective. Please look back at those yeah, minutes and notes. Look at the notes yeah. But why I presented this um, New York Post article dated today is there are different viewpoints. No, and this is very right, important. The right. there are, yes, and this is important to all of us no, sitting here. Yeah. Do, do you know who yeah. she is? Who this woman? Is. She is an atmospheric professor. Um, I think she at the time... Um, this person? Yes, I know. Mm -hmm. She's a well-known skeptic, funded deeply by the fossil fuel industry. The arguments in here, every single one of them has been recycled about 20 years worth of times. I've seen him many, many times, so, I mean, the, 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 With all due respect, this was printed to I day. understand, except that the arguments, like, for example, alarmist scientists' aggressive attempts to hide data suggesting climate change is not a crisis were revealed in leaked emails, dates back to a thing in 2009. So that's the only time that this is, about, and the case has been litigated, and, and, you know, basically no hiding was found. It was jargon of scientists in talking to each other. Anyway. But the point of it is, these kinds of things come out every so often. Today is apparently one of those publication dates, and the, and, and Judy Curry has been, you know, f has been revealed, ha has been funded by the fossil fuel industry to say these things. I don't know how many times. I mean, this I is don't like know who, who or what the thing is. This is, whole but, argument that she's talking about is irrelevant to Hadley. We are simply trying to respond to the very real things that are happening here. I think that's terrific. You know, so it, Deerfield yeah. got washed mm -hmm. out horribly, and mm -hmm. what happened up in Vermont, these are very real things that, that happen, and we are right on the river, and we need to pay attention. Well, we need to be yeah. ready. We yeah. need to do some things, put in larger culverts or whatever we need to do to you know, minimize what horror could take mm -hmm. place here. And, no and disagreement. No we're disagreement. Have, we're yeah. having big yeah. great events. And, and you know, in all honesty, you know, just seeing farmer after farmer having to harrow up their crops, farmer after farmer not being able to harvest their crops mm -hmm. this year, you know, you can say, well, the other side of the argument is there's no problem, and I guess you're going to get all your money, except they're not going to. They won't. And, you know, if you look at our mission statement, we assemble and explain information regarding the town's current ecological footprint. We did that with the audit related to green community. Assemble and explain information regarding potential actions the town might take to reduce eco our ecological footprint. 
help the town evaluate, choose, and implement the actions that promote sustainable practices and monitor the change in town's ecological footprint over time. Those are the kinds of things that we are looking at constantly with our I mean, guests yeah, and everybody I, else. The other issue with our farms and, and these floods that took place now, it not only hurt the farmers and the crops that they lost mm -hmm. and the income they would get from those crops, what about the people who had paid for their CSAs? Mm -hmm. they, they're out. The, you know, a few hundred dollars, whatever they paid. Fortunately, surrounding farms have kicked in and brought, you know, donated vegetables to help people still get their shares. But, I mean, this is, this is for real. This is our food. And how you know, many hundreds of farm workers are sitting there idle now because mm -hmm. they don't have the work to do? This is a big deal. Not to mention the mosquito situation. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, but you just had the fire chief here mm -hmm. saying the problem with lithium batteries, how they explode, yeah. that they can burn down a house, yeah. that if you have them, do not have them yeah. in the cellar, that they should be in a garage. The, um, the, the mansions, Newport, Rhode Island, you have a mansion, then you have a separate boiling, boiler system mm -hmm. yeah. because the boilers would explode and burn on the house, so they figured out keep them separate. Well, do you have to drive a car? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. That comes with risks. I every agree completely. Every technology. I he agree also completely. actually said, I'm glad everybody has solar on their roofs. He actually said that. So well, every technology comes yeah. with risks. The whole point that we were actually making in this presentation is not to impose anything on anybody, but to have an inclusive process to hear everybody's opinions about what, what concerns do you have, what do you want to see happen in Hadley, how do we create the town we want. It's not about imposing a science, it's not about imposing a policy, it's about creating a process to bring the community together. That's I mean, well, and what, I, we're, what and we're good at. You know, I remember when Brian, West was, when Brian West was the one who said, take a look at the town buildings. We did that. Mm -hmm. Earned us $139,000 for it. So we can make them better. But it's so much more than this. I just see the people who don't get to work on a daily basis because the farms are shut down, because I, they're flooded, I, and it's I, devastating. I, I do not could, could disagree I with any of yeah. this. Yeah. I think it's incredibly irresponsible of you. Every single meeting I've attended, you've brought up the weather, and you've, you've, you've related it to climate change. You have no idea if no, this storm... No, we really Please, don't. let me finish. I'm speaking. You have no idea that this storm is related to climate change. And, and this is not the first flood we've had in Hadley. And you're sitting here, and you, you do this every single meeting. At the, in the springtime, well, you, at the springtime, you said, oh, Wally's getting out his uh, irrigation equipment earlier than ever. A week later, it started raining. And, right. And now, it, but not, every, not everything that happens in the weather is related to a climate crisis. And if I were to say to you, if I were to stand up and say, hey, there's no such thing as climate change because August has been way below temperature. Right. Obviously, it's all over. You would, well, you would say July was, was actually a record for the world. Okay, but August is lower. That's, that's just yeah. as foolish it, as it you was. Saying, that's just as foolish as you saying, oh, we had a rain event, so, so that's climate change. The farmers are out of work. This has been going on for this, centuries. This, no. yeah. this, is, yeah, this is all ahead. semantics, folks. Stop. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, 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 just, yeah. It's all it's, semantics. Yeah. I hear yeah. you. You don't want us to say the word climate change. We don't need to say climate change anymore. We can stop Actually, saying that. We're Actually, just worrying about the time. Jane, you know, I don't participate in that. I'm not, we're way too far down the road to no longer talk about the climate crisis. Climate is an average term for the patterns of variability of the weather. And yes, we have had variability before. It's just that we're moving out of the envelope of what has historically been true for this last region month, and for the rest month, of you the said world. Three times, total system collapse. Yes. Where's the evidence for that? Yeah. In Alaska is what I talked about. In Hawaii not, yesterday. I mean, day after day, day it's the lead story on the news. Hawaii, that's climate change. You don't know that. Actually, Whether it is or not, it's happening. It's and whatever is happening, we need to address it. You can't just sit here doing nothing. I'm but, fine with that, but don't. But you're saying you're relating everything that happens to climate change. Yeah. It's just not true. Hysteria. I mean, we don't know. It's the hysteria. We don't know. Whoa, 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 whoa. It's, it's, it's not it's here to see. Yeah. 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 variability that, yes, we're moving in that, and increasingly it goes out of it. And what we're concerned is that we're not prepared for that. There's no study that's showing we're in total system collapse in Alaska no. or anywhere else. No. 
I'm sorry, I was gonna, can I can I just really get this on the damn record? Yeah. What Ooh. I quoted was a woman. Her name is Gay Sheffield, who is with a, uh, Alaska Sea Grant marine biologist, mm -hmm. who was saying that very word to me. I have the transcript if you would like to see it. Okay, Somebody else. that she is was one person I was interviewing. Time. You said it three for, times for, on your own. You said we are we are in it. I, I quoted I, her. Do not come on. I know exactly what I said, and I know where that quote comes from. You don't know it. If you want to see it, I have it on fucking transcript, okay? Yeah, and I'm we, sorry. We are, I'm, I'm not letting you put something in my mouth that I didn't say. That is the truth. <clears throat> she said it. It's well, about what's happening there, and if you don't believe it, why don't you go travel there and let so, her explain it to you? But do not make me... Like, put something in my mouth I didn't say. What I'm worried about is that Alaska is a precursor because things are happening way faster there than they are happening here. And we are sitting here having this conversation while we should be preparing for what's coming. I agree with Alaska. Okay. Yes. So, all right, then let me just put the period right there. One more point I, one more point I need to make was the yeah. point I started to That's make bullshit. was a question that I have. Yeah. Last week, and I'm not qualified to talk about chemtrails, I don't want to talk about chemtrails. Good. We didn't meet last week. Uh, last last week. Okay, so right. Sorry. Okay. The, the issue came up. Jack, you said you were not familiar, very familiar with chemtrails. Most people on the committee were not familiar with chemtrails. Um, so I looked it up. You looked it and up. Did and did some research. I see on the, on the minutes, I think this is on the minutes, there was a statement. Mm -hmm. The next section of the meeting includes information that is not based in science and is a conspiracy theory. The climate, the climate committee is a science-based yes. committee, therefore... We do not support the chemtrails claims referenced below. That's correct. Where did that come from? You, you read that it. Is, you. Where did that come that from? is what we've talked about. Yeah. Where did that come from? Yeah. That statement. That we, statement. We put that statement on the minutes. We, we put it on the minutes because we talked yeah. about it. Yeah. Is that irrelevant? Is that irrelevant? No, 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 no. Because no, no, no. we're, we're talking about open meetings. Open meetings doesn't include open meeting. Is you being here and hearing what we say it has nothing to do with audience participation. It is not a required law. This is on. This is a statement from that was that was discussed at the meeting. We would be happy. Where nobody had anything that. to any. It nobody knew happen. anything about chemtrails. Now there are definitive proclamations from the climate change committee. Where did they come from? That's all I want to know. Yeah. It's not true that nobody on the committee knows about Where it. Does Sorry, the I've come been from? trained oh. as a climate scientist. Yeah. I know it's a, f a conspiracy. I respect that, I'm, but I'm, I'm saying, yeah. where did the statement come from? And this wasn't the only one. There were several definitive statements. We discussed it here. Yeah. We said, no, no, not no. No. Actually, I, I said at that at the end of that meeting, I, I would like for this committee to be a fact-based meeting. This is a conspiracy theory. This is not what this committee should be dealing with. Did you vote on it? Do we vote on it? We do vote on it. This is we, a statement from the no, climate. We, we don't need vote to and vote on anything. We're taking, this is a, we're taking we're a transcript of what that. people say during these meetings. No, this is your statement. This is from the Climate Change Committee. I'm just trying to say, where did the statement come from? This it, is a it's, statement. It's based it's on what I Susie. asked. Susie Susie made this what this committee Susie said. not be based on this. I, th I think you're giving me the runaround here. Mm. I think you know what oh, I'm Tony, there's not much runaround that happens on this committee. <laughs> Jack, I'm asking you a, a simple question. You, you, you I it, believe it, Susie said it because I know she had it, Susie, gone back to not, that this statement. Does not say Susie says it's a conspiracy. So the climate change committee. That, that was my fault because I, I'm the one who does the minutes. We, so we, I'll, I'll, I'll but we that. concluded that but together yeah, at the end. Did yeah. that, yeah. Yes, I, didn't say I, saw, I watched the meeting. There was often, no conclusion. Actually, I often do not say person, I say community member or committee member. The last thing on the, before the video shut off and Jack closed the meeting was uh, Ms. Nevin Smith was saying we need to, someone, needs, someone needs to watch the video, someone said I'm already watching it. Jack, before that you said I don't know much about it and then you said... And I didn't know much about it Kelly, that's why I looked it up. Kelly said we need, Kelly said we're still on video, we need to close the meeting, the meeting was closed. And now there's a definitive statement saying the Climate Change Committee does on not that leave. same meeting, but it, yeah, it, it, yes. it, that was on the same meeting. Yeah. It didn't happen. It's after also the on the agenda. Mm -hmm. it's on the agenda. Oh, where is it on the agenda? It's on the where agenda right here today. Well, it says. I think. Well, because you also read, it says read. notes from last meeting taken from, and I cite the source. But that anyway. that source was not discussed during the meeting, was it? No, that source never came up. No, the because I found the source since the last meeting. 
That's what you can't do. <laughs> you can't you can't make a statement based on something. You, you well, hold it. There was a question that came up about chemtrails. I didn't know much about it. I found a source and I put it out to everybody so everybody would have the same information for today's meeting. It's oh, not, no, but, but in the minutes, he's correct. What oh. he's reading so it's some kind of in thing the we minutes. need to correct. Yeah, in the minutes. I will correct okay. it in the minutes. I'd be happy to do that. Okay. I'm, I'm, um, I'm, one thing I want to make clear for everybody we are here as a team, as a team mm -hmm. to protect each other. Okay. Let her finish, though. Mm -hmm. Let her finish. I, I agree with the, what uh, yeah. Ms. Bozer said that trust, we have to build trust if we're going to do yeah. any of these things. Mm -hmm. well, I, I see the same thing. Something's not right here. Something's not right. I would really like to request in that regard that you do not put words into my mouth. It, I simply did not say what you said. I will not trust you, you, you to report it, you correctly it, on what I say. If you it, you you're, it. you're saying you're recording it. I'll, I'll take your. I'll take that out. This value and accept that. But you did quote it, it three times. You did say it three times. Yeah. Okay. The point is, it's important to me that we actually take seriously what people who are ahead in the climate change curve are experiencing and take it seriously so that we can prepare and be ready for that. The conversation we had this evening with Chris and with you know Michael, that to me was helpful information because that tells me what we're doing, what we're not yet doing. What that's kind of that's helpful. I agree. So think, that's what I'm here for. And I think if we're, if we're trust, here yeah. just to discuss chemtrails and conspiracy theories and, and fossil fuel right, right. Like funded people, I'm not interested. I'm here to deal with the issues that we're facing and what's coming. Well, I guess my concern is where does the other one get us? It doesn't get us anywhere. anywhere. It doesn't get us moving forward. It All right. delays us greatly. Yeah, let's, let's call this meeting to a close.